يمحق الله الربا ويربي الصدقات والله Of the many features of Islamic civilization one that often stands out to economists is the fact that the charging of interest was not part of its economic life. Today there are powerful forces at work that want us to forget that fact. They want us to believe that interest is an indispensable ingredient of economic success. But even in the Western world, where the practices of interest are most developed, things haven't always been that way. One of the most famous acts of Jesus' ministry was to kick the users out of the temple. 1500 years later, usury was still prohibited throughout most of Christendom. A succession of church gatherings confirmed the prohibition, among them the Council of Nicaea in 325 and the Lateran Council of 1179. Those who practiced usury were seen as parasites, earning an unnatural living at the expense of society around them. Today, everything has changed. Usury is no longer a criminal offense in England, no longer something to feel ashamed of. It's practiced everywhere, openly and unashamedly, and far from being sent to prison, those who do it best win prestigious awards. In around the year 1220 after Christ, a researcher in Rome named Hispanus argued that it was in fact permissible to charge for making a loan. But Hispanus said it wasn't permissible to charge from the outset of the loan. You could only charge if the borrower was late in repaying. The period in between the date on which the loan should have been repaid and the date when it was repaid, Hispanus termed inter essa, that which in between is. By the time of King Henry VIII, inter essa, or interest as it was by then known, had been made legal up to the rate of 10%. Anything above 10% was seen as nasty, evil usury. Anything below was not usury and was therefore permitted, which explains why today people talk of usurious rates of interest. Before the innovations, no such distinction existed. But even while King Henry was busy permitting interest, others were devising new ways of circumventing the church prohibition on usury. One of these ways was the triple contract, the contractum trinius, a combination of three contracts that the church viewed as permissible, but which, when put together, formed a loan at interest. In step one, the lender invests £100 with the borrower under a profit-sharing agreement. In step two, the lender insures himself against a loss on his investment by paying an insurance premium of £2 to the borrower. That way, he knows he'll always get back his original investment of £100, even if the borrower makes a loss in his business. And in step three, the lender sells his right to any profit on the investment back to the borrower for a price of £7. Taken together, the three contracts produce an interest payment of £5 on a loan of £100. In the late 17th and early 18th centuries, a new breed of thinkers, the economists, arose. One such thinker, Nassau Senior, promoted the idea that interest was justified because the lender of money gave up the use of that money. He gave up the pleasure he could have had by spending it instead of lending it. But there was a problem with this theory. What if the lender was a very rich man? With all those millions in the bank, you wouldn't have to give up very much pleasure at all if you lent one of your poorer friends a few hundred pounds but you could still charge him interest. Mr. Senior's theory quietly bit the dust. Yet the arguments in favour of interest continued to emerge from every corner of European thought. Calvinists supported the practice, as did many merchants who made their profits from borrowing and lending money. By the early 20th century, the Catholic Church capitulated too. In 1920, the Pope pronounced that it was no longer prohibited to profit from the lending of money. Yes, I mean, I was nurtured on the understanding that usury was forbidden by the Bible and also by the kind of teaching about ordinary life that my parents gave me. I realized it was common sense that money should not be exploiting others, that it should be based on the sharing of joy and sorrow and the risk and reward, which is a Muslim insight, and I was nurtured to believe it was a Christian insight. So I was deeply disappointed as I discovered wherever I went that the church didn't face this issue, wouldn't discuss it, even when raised frankly before them. After the defeat of the usury prohibition in the West, a very different kind of world began to appear, one in which the worship of God gave way to the worship of material things. Presiding over this new way of life was the market. Some economists went so far as to bestow upon the market powers that had hitherto been reserved for God himself. 
For these men, the market was all-knowing. Whatever it decided had to be right for society. The market was all-powerful. You couldn't fight it. You couldn't buck the market, to use Margaret Thatcher's old phrase. That the supporters of free market capitalism should today criticise religion for being an impediment to economic progress, for them to say that religion should steer clear of public life, these are among the great ironies of our time. For the fact is that free market capitalism has become a religion in its own right. It has a set of core values that students and public alike are infused with, values that are held above challenge, no matter what misery they may have inflicted upon the world at large. A thousand years ago, money in England was made from silver. One pound in weight of silver was minted into approximately 240 coins. Each coin was called a penny, and naturally enough, 240 pennies were given the name one pound. But the kings of England couldn't resist playing with the monetary system. From time to time, they'd force the people to hand in their silver pennies in exchange for new ones. The old ones would be melted down with a cheaper metal. Copper was a common choice and new coins would be minted from that mixture. Each new coin looked more or less the same as before, but coin for coin contained less silver. The king, meanwhile, could take the surplus silver obtained from the recoinage process and build himself a new palace, or fight a war somewhere. English merchants often suspected that something was wrong, and in many cases decided to put up their prices following a recoinage. What they were selling their goods for was a weight of silver, so if each new coin contained less silver than before, then they'd rightly ask for more coins in payment. By the year 1666 in England, the kings had debased the coinage so much that 240 pennies no longer contained anywhere near one pound in weight of silver. One pound had become the name of the unit of currency, a token of value, no longer a description of its weight in silver. When the first bankers arrived on the scene in the middle of the 17th century, they took the principle of token money to its logical extreme. They produced a piece of paper worth nothing at all and gave it a monetary value. That piece of paper was to make them rich beyond their wildest dreams. The early bankers were often goldsmiths who had safe vaults where they could keep their precious metals and jewellery. Merchants who wanted to keep their gold and silver safe would sometimes come to the goldsmith and ask him to store their money in his vault. The goldsmith would give the merchant a receipt for the coins deposited. Often the receipt would be made payable to the bearer. In other words, the one bearing the receipt back to the goldsmith could reclaim the coins. It didn't have to be the original depositor. Soon, a remarkable development took place in English society. Merchants began paying for their goods and services using the goldsmith's paper receipts. There was no point in going to the goldsmith, handing in the receipt, getting the gold coins and then going to spend them if a shopkeeper would accept the receipt in payment anyway. This gave the goldsmiths an opportunity to change their business model entirely. Instead of acting as safe keepers of coins in their vaults, they transformed themselves into money lenders. And when people came to the bank to borrow, what the goldsmith lent them was not gold or silver coinage, but paper receipts, which they printed at no cost in the back of their shops. The goldsmith had acquired the power to create money out of nothing. The more paper money the banker printed, the more he could lend and the more he lent, the more interest he could earn. It was therefore natural for banks to create and lend as much money as possible. But as they did so, prices throughout the economy began to rise. And if people came to the bank asking for redemption of their paper receipts in gold coins, the bankers knew that they didn't have enough to make good on their promises. <laughs> 